Um, friends, I wish I could have been with you in person this morning, that was the plan, uh, but at short notice I'm afraid a small crisis has cropped up to which I've had to give priority. I want first of all to apologise for my absence and to assure you that I wouldn't lightly withdraw from any commitment I've made and least of all to you church wardens. But let me also say secondly how grateful I am to Archdeacon Steve and to LJ, our communications manager, uh, to Steve for suggesting that I record this presentation and to LJ for making it happen. So I want to speak to you for about 20 minutes to let you know how valuable your contribution is to the life of our diocese and to spell out a little how I think you can play your part most fruitfully. I have to admit that it's now over a decade since I was a parish priest with church wardens as my colleagues but in the 30 years I've spent in ordained ministry, I have relied heavily on people in that role for over half the time, for 16 years to be exact. And I was blessed in that time in the calibre of the church wardens with whom I've worked, and I remain hugely grateful to God for them. For the next 20 minutes then, I'm going to speak, first of all, about the things which, in my opinion, make a good church warden, things which I've valued most in the church wardens with whom I've worked. These are things which I believe would be true wherever in the Church of England you happen to look, uh, not just in the Diocese of Sheffield, in other words. I want to talk about prayer and risk and loyalty. Then I want to talk more specifically about our diocese and about the ways in which you can help to fulfil the diocesan strategy. I want to talk about the common fund and mission partnerships and the so-called mixed economy. First of all then, what makes a good church warden? Well, I find I want to say to you what I want to say to those who are beginning to explore a vocation to ordained ministry and who are asking, what makes a good vicar? The most basic requirement, both to be an effective church warden and to be an effective vicar, or, or bishop for that matter, is to be a committed follower of Jesus Christ. Notice that I don't say a good follower or even a faithful follower and certainly not an outstanding follower of Christ. Fortunately, we can all rely on the grace of God to compensate for our limitations. In fact, for me, that's almost a requirement in itself, to know your limitations and to rely on the grace of God to compensate. But my point is, an effective church warden exercises a vital role in a congregation in modelling something about the church, about the heart of the church, about what lies at the centre of church, which is the commitment to Jesus our daily intention to walk in his ways, to follow him. That's why I said I wanted to make some observations about prayer. My friends, I, I'm sure you'll feel under pressure to maintain your terrier and inventory and to keep the registers up to date. And I know the archdeacons would not thank me if I were to suggest that you can sit loose to those things. But I'm also certain they would agree with me that there is a higher priority than those things which is for you to invest daily in your relationship with God, to, to nurture your spiritual health and strength, uh, reading your Bible and calling on the Lord in prayer, seeking to grow in him, to be fashioned more and more fully in the likeness of Jesus himself, and especially seeking his help, his wisdom and guidance in the fulfilment of your responsibilities and in the fulfilment of his purpose for your parish. So I want to encourage you to make that your number one priority as a church warden, daily to throw yourselves afresh on the love and mercy of God and to ask him for the help of the Holy Spirit. But secondly, let me say something about courage. My friends, this is not an easy season to be a church warden. Once upon a time, maybe the status it brought and the resources available meant that church wardens could relax and bask in the glory of the role. Maybe, although I couldn't swear to it. In any case, you'll all know much better than me that this is not the case now. Now it's hard work. Now there is almost no status, not, not even really when the bishop visits and you get to process with your staffs. Now there are few resources to help you. Instead, there are increased expectations and challenging dynamics. Buildings which are seldom fit for purpose, attendances at worship which are often declining, reduced numbers of stipendary clergy and financial challenges too. It is a heavy load, and I'm so grateful to you for agreeing to bear it at all. But since you have agreed, let me encourage you to be bold. This is not a time for faint-hearted church wardens, any more than it's a time for faint-hearted clergy. I want to encourage you to see this as a privilege, actually. 
to have a part to play in this period of huge transition as the Church of England reshapes itself for mission in the 21st century. It's actually a wonderful thing to be called to serve God at such time as this. I genuinely believe that 50 years from now, our descendants and successors will look back on this generation and say, thank God for their courage, for their creativity in the 2000s, the 2010s, the 2020s. They saw the church through a crisis and navigated some choppy waters. In other words, it's no good wishing we lived in another era. It's no good me wishing that I could have been the first Bishop of Sheffield or the fourth or, or the fourteenth. I'm the eighth and I have to shoulder the challenges of this time. And I'm ready to do that and I'm hoping that you're ready to do it too. Together we will have to be courageous, bold in taking risks in our readiness to experiment, to think new thoughts and imagine new ways. I don't mean that the old ways, the inherited ways, have no future or no value. That's something I'll come back to a little later. But it is clear, isn't it, that they're not going to be enough in themselves to serve us well going forward. The world is changing and we have to change with it. But change is not easy and it takes courage to manage change. That's the second thing. And then I want to say something thirdly about loyalty, or I could say trust. Most congregations thrive most when relationships between key leaders are good. Is that an obvious thing to say? Most congregations thrive most when relationships between key leaders are good. And that includes the way that church wardens relate to each other and the way that you relate to your incumbent and your PCC. Of course there are limits and your first obligation is always loyalty to God, so I'm not asking you to support your clergy in any and all circumstances. In fact, if they are out of order and you don't call them on it, who will? But I do know how much it meant to me as a parish priest to know that my church wardens had my back covered. I know how much it meant to me to know that they were not grumbling about me behind my back. How important it was to me when they were up front with me about my failings and mistakes and spoke to me face to face about those things. Few things are so corrosive in church life as, as murmuring and, and gossip and, and few things in my experience are, are such an amazing gateway to the Holy Spirit as a leadership team which has learnt to trust one another, to be loyal and uh, patient with one another. So those are things which I think are probably true in every diocese of the Church of England at present. Those are three things which I reckon make a good church warden anywhere. Prayer, courage and loyalty. But now I'd like to go on to speak about three things which I think we need here specifically in the Diocese of Sheffield if we are to rise to the challenges and opportunities of the present time and if we are to see our diocesan strategy realised. Here I want to return to the themes I introduced in the sermon at my installation, namely Jesus, grace and generosity. I expect some of you were there. My message that day was that the only proper response to the grace that God has shown us in sending Jesus to be our saviour is gratitude, expressed as generosity. I shared, that, uh, I shared on that occasion my conviction that God has called me here to foster a diocese which is generous with Jesus. When I say generous with Jesus, I am of course thinking at least partly of financial generosity. Indeed, as I said uh, in my installation sermon, I will inevitably have to speak about giving uh, at various points in the months ahead. But I also emphasised in that sermon that financial generosity is not in itself enough. God calls us to demonstrate generosity in our relationships, both in our relationships with fellow Christians and in our relationships with those outside the church. So now I want to speak about the Common Fund, mission partnerships and about the so-called mixed economy, which is to say generosity with money, generosity with neighbouring parishes and generosity in mission as we seek to share Jesus with the world. First of all then, financial generosity. Later this morning you'll meet David Stout, our new generous giving advisor, and I'm sure you'll want to give him a warm welcome and a careful hearing. It's four years now since Archdeacon Steve led a series of consultations which led to the abandonment of the old parish share system and the introduction of our common fund. I hope you'll agree that the new arrangements are a big step forward. They give power and freedom back to the parishes and cast off any idea of a diocesan tax. But the bottom line is that the Common Fund hasn't yet been able to reverse the already existing trend, which we had hoped an appeal to open generosity might be able to do. So at present we face a continued reduction in income to the Board of Finance, and therefore a reduction of decision-making freedom at the heart of the diocese. 
I don't suppose that result, the reduction in decision-making freedom, is always well understood in the parishes. And I'm not asking you to make that case for us, uh, but it is the reality. If income from the Common Fund continues to drop, so will the decision-making freedom of the bishop staff and the diocesan synod. We'll end up making decisions, for example, about the deployment of clergy based on our falling income, rather than out of a sense of the need on the ground, let alone out of a sense of what the Lord might be calling us to. But though I'm not asking you to help us make that case to parishes, I am asking you to ensure that there is in your parish a good engagement with David and the skills and resources he brings with him. I do ask you to ensure that at least annually there is an attempt in your parish, through sermons and notices, to review levels of giving. Not only, but not least, to the diocese. One of the things I'll be asking David to discover is what difference it would make if everyone who regards themselves as a regular worshipper in our congregations was to pledge to increase their giving to the diocese by one pound a week. I'm not sure, but I suspect it could be transformative. You see, the latest data I have suggests that each week there are about 16,000 people at worship across the diocese on any given Sunday. So if 16,000 people increase giving by one pound a week, how much do you think that would add to the common fund? Staggering as it may seem, the answer is over £800,000, £50 a year more from each of 16,000 people. It would utterly transform the diocese's uh, finances at a stroke. We might even be able to pension off David before he's even got his feet under the table. Amazing, isn't it? I hope that's a vision you will feel you can commit to supporting in your parishes. Secondly, I want to say something about mission partnerships and about being generous in our relationships with neighbouring parishes. Most of us recognise, I think, what I was saying a moment ago, as certainly most of you will do, that the inherited patterns of church are not sustainable. We don't have the numbers of clergy that we had historically. Even 20 years ago, when I was a parish priest in Gateshead, I remember watching our deanery allocation drop from 32 full-time stipendaries to 18. That was 20 years ago. I dread to think what the numbers there are now. But even back then, those 18 were expected to maintain the same model of ministry that they had inherited from 32, and it, it just can't be done. Some of you are probably aware that this decline is not in fact financially driven nationally. It's primarily a vocational decline nationwide. We simply have more priests retiring than we've been able to recruit into ordained ministry. So over the next few months and years you will find me and my colleagues on the Bishop's Senior Staff making real efforts to drive up the number of those who are called by God into ordained ministry. We're on a recruitment drive. But for the time being, that old pattern of one parish, one building, one stipendary vicar is gone. And we need to find new ways of growing the church. And Mission Partnerships offers the best way forward that we've been able to discern. Parishes sharing resources and making plans together for the future. Asking together what the opportunities and challenges are for the worship and mission of God. And seeking together to find the solutions. That's the second thing. I want to urge you, please, to be generous when it comes to conversations about mission partnerships. Generous in sharing the resources at your disposal. Generous in looking for solutions which benefit not just your own parish, but the deanery or diocese as a whole. So then lastly, let me say something about the so-called mixed economy and about missionary generosity. In the sermon at my installation, I said that the phrase, generous with Jesus, didn't just mean that those who pledge their allegiance to Jesus are bound to be generous as he is generous, but also that those who pledge their allegiance to Jesus are bound to be generous with him. One of the things with which we will want to be generous is Jesus himself. We will want to give him away, sharing him as freely as we have received him. What that will mean in practice is, for want of a better phrase, the mixed economy. By mixed economy I mean a blend of old and new. And that means old styles of worship in old familiar places like Holy Communion in the parish church, and old styles of worship in new and unfamiliar places like Holy Communion in care homes or school halls. And it means new styles of worship in old and familiar places like messy church in the parish church, and it means new styles of worship in new and unfamiliar places like cafe-style worship in the back room of a pub. In other words, the mixed economy means embracing diversity in the attempt to reach out with the good news of Jesus to the full breadth of the communities we serve. 
It means taking Jesus to the people, not sitting back and waiting for them to discover us. But it also means warmly welcoming the people when they do discover us, when they come to us. And it means offering to them a version of church which meets their needs and, and not just ours. That's the generous thing to do, and I hope you'll feel able to support it and to support your clergy as they pursue it. My friends, I must stop. Uh, I've talked a lot about the, the support I hope you will give to your clergy because I do remember how much I valued the support I received as a parish priest from my church wardens. But I want to finish by repeating what I said at the beginning, that you exercise a hugely important and demanding ministry. And because I know that, I hope very much that I can find ways to support you as your bishop in the work to which God has called you. Thank you for giving up yet another Saturday morning to invest in this ministry. I hope you'll go away uplifted and encouraged, feeling better equipped and more fully informed for the challenges and opportunities which lie before us. I'm genuinely excited and hopeful about the future and I hope you are too. Thank you for listening. Enjoy the rest of the day and may God bless you.